Hi there folks, this is Patrick Sarge Murray here for Travel to Learn, and today we're exploring the Frontiers of Flight Museum here in Dallas, Texas. Let's check out all the cool stuff they have here on display, shall we? At one end of the building, they have a small wing dedicated primarily to the history of Southwest Airlines. This is only fitting considering that Southwest Corporate Headquarters is right next door, right by Love Field, which is where this museum is located, and also because Love Field itself is basically the de facto hub for Southwest Airlines. There are various Southwest-related artifacts on display, whole graphic walls showing the timeline of Southwest, and also a mini-gallery showing other important pictures and paragraphs of the history of Southwest Airlines. Also as part of this aforementioned mini-gallery is an enlarged bronze model of the cocktail napkin that one of the founders drew up that basically illustrated Southwest's initial strategy. Pretty cool. But the thing above all else that will attract your attention in this exhibit is an actual Southwest Airlines Boeing 737, most of which is actually outside of the building as you can see. But you can actually go inside the plane too and inside you see more Southwest Airlines related artifacts as well as depictions of the key milestones for the company. But let's not kid ourselves, the real action is at the other end of the building, here in the main wing, starting with the boat B-173, aka the Flying Pancake. Now undoubtedly you're wondering, well, why is this plane shaped so weirdly? Well, there's a functional design behind that, and that idea was for the plane to be able to take off in this inclined static position you're seeing right now and do so in basically a reverse half arch sort of trajectory. Basically a propeller driven forerunner to the BTOL fighter jets of more modern eras. This plane was first designed in 1939 and actually took its first flights in 1942. Yes, this model actually flew 199 times to be exact according to the information presented here at the museum and believe it or not, Charles Lindbergh flew this model twice. Now, how did the pilots get in this thing, you're wondering? Well, there's actually a hatch at the underside that they crawled into in order to get into this plane. It's an amazing experimental design to behold overall. Here in the main wing, there are all sorts of cool things hung aloft, such as a full-scale model of the Wright Brothers' famous 1903 flyer. And right next to it, there is a model of Leonardo da Vinci's famous design for a parachute from the 16th century. It was quite clear to me that the Frontiers of Flight Museum has been dedicated to showing all eras of flight, from the earliest powered flight to the modern day today. And nothing was more evident to me about this commitment than seeing a Curtis JN4 on display, better known as the Jenny. Now, why is this model of aircraft so significant? Well, for one, it was the first major model of aircraft that was used by the U.S. Army to train uh, pilots for flight during World War I. And afterwards, uh, the surplus of these models were sold to private individuals, and that in turn led to the barnstorming era of aviation in the 1920s that awakened the American public to civil aviation that decade. So, when it comes to significance, this very model really is a twofer. Another really cool thing they have hung aloft here is a Northrop T-38 Talon. Now this design might not look entirely dated, but it was first test flown as early as 1959 and formally introduced into the United States Air Force in 1961. The uh, purpose of this uh, particular aircraft is that it's a supersonic trainer. Yes, that's right, you heard me, supersonic. Uh, this is capable of flying up to speeds of 820 miles per hour. Another interesting little bit about this particular model of aircraft is that NASA has had a whole fleet of them uh, based in Ellington Air Force Base in Houston. And during the Apollo era, the Apollo astronauts would use the T-38s as commuter aircraft to go in between uh, major sites such as the, uh, the North American plant in Southern California for a uh, Apollo simulation and Apollo uh, model testing, then they would fly to Houston, or they would also fly from Houston out to Cape Canaveral uh, for uh, further training and for launch simulation. So this T-38 has some very, very interesting history behind it all, all around. 
In one room upstairs, they have several different aircraft engines from various eras. Here we see a, an, a sterling example of radial engine design, the Pratt & Whitney Wasp. Notice all those metal flanges on the cylinders. That's to maximize the surface area so as to allow for air cooling, as opposed to li the liquid cool designs one normally sees in the V-type engines. Those polished aluminum tubes are meant to protect the uh, valve lifter rods. Here in the middle we see the torque converter, and behind the torque converter is a large disc with cams on there that actuated the valve lifters. It just wouldn't be a legitimate air and space museum without at least one room dedicated to World War II. Here they have all sorts of neat artifacts from that period on display. But the real showstopper in the room is clearly this, an engine from a P-51 Mustang. Now, to be sure, I've seen a, a few P-51 Mustang engines at museums elsewhere, but it never gets old seeing them. It's amazing to behold all of these intricate details in the mechanics when you can see these up close and in person. Notice that massive torque converter. Another cool thing to check out is the overhead cam layout on the engine heads, one per head. Of course, even all these previously covered items on display are really, really cool to varying degrees. The most important artifact here on display, by far, without any question, is this, the Apollo 7. Yes, that's right, they have an actual, honest-to-goodness, mission-flown NASA space capsule right here at the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas. This is the Apollo 7. Its significance, of course, is that it's the first successfully launched and flown manned Apollo space capsule. That's pretty darn significant. Let's take a closer look at one of the corners of this spacecraft. That large white dot you see near the bottom, that is an S-band flush-mounted antenna. And those two ovals you see tilted towards one another, those are roll engines. But let's take an even closer look at the surface of this spacecraft. See this hexagonal pattern? That is the Abelidopeat shield, designed to protect the spacecraft during re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. And it's made up of an acrylic resin. Now that acrylic resin was injected into each one of those hexagonally shaped cells. And it was done so by hand. Yes, you heard that correctly. Each one of those many, 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 many cells was filled in by hand. What's in a hatch? Well, if you know anything about the history of the space race and of the Apollo program specifically, you would know that this hatch is very significant indeed. Why? Well, for one, the hatch on the first Apollo capsules could only open inwards from the inside as opposed to opening outwards like you see here. Also, this is a much simplified mechanism for opening the hatch up. It was a lot more elaborate on the previous version of this hatch. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal for two reasons. Again, if you know anything about the history of the space program, you would know that the Apollo 1 crew was killed in the fire inside their command module in late January of 1967. One of the reasons they were killed is that the process took too long for the airlock of the hatch to be released. The even bigger problem was that once things were finally ready to be opened, the combustion inside the command module created so much pressure that even the physically strongest man in the astronaut corps, Ed White, was unable to open up the capsule from the inside. The three men were thus trapped inside until they died from smoke inhalation. This hat shows the redesign that was made following that tragedy. It was designed to make to open outwards so as to not have the same trapping problem again, and it was also redesigned to open up quickly, as well as with the ergonomics in mind in case such a similar evacuation would ever be necessary again. So like I said, that's a pretty significant hatch. Taking a look at another corner of this spacecraft, 
we're seeing that a lot more of the Amulet of Heat Shield has worn off here. This is the edge of the spacecraft that led in most during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Because this was the leading edge of the craft upon re-entry, it bore the brunt of all the intense heat from the friction due to the craft's initially high velocity when being slowed down by the air in the atmosphere. Hence, the reason why so much more of the Apple of the Peach Shield has been worn off here at this particular edge. Neat, huh? In case you're wondering how the command module got all of its electrical power and other consumables such as water and oxygen from the service module, well, what you're seeing here is a connective receptacle that allowed for that to happen. All the electrical connections, the oxygen connection, the water valve, all of that came from the service module into the command module via these connectors. And when the command module separated from the service module, a guillotine-like device was triggered that severed all these electrical wires and sh closed up all these valves that allowed for the command module to re-enter on its own. Since they have an Apollo space capsule on display, it would only stand to reason that they would have an Apollo space suit on display. And so, behold, this is the pressure training suit of Don F. Isley, who is the command module pilot for the Apollo 7 mission. Pretty cool. Indeed, there's all sorts of cool stuff here in this display case. For one, there's an astronaut lunar boot, famous for leaving those big footprints on the moon. Here we see some Apollo spacesuit gloves. Red meant right, blue meant left. And of course, there's also the iconic astronaut communications carrier, dubbed the Snoopy Cap because of its black and white coloration. Various other artifacts here include an astronaut Apollo era helmet, as well as an Apollo 7 patch, not to mention Walt Cunningham's Omega Speedmaster chronograph. That was a watch model of choice for the NASA astronauts back in the day. Now this corner of the spacecraft is similar to the first one we saw, but with a lot more features. Case in point, what we're seeing here is a plug for the urine dump. When urine was expelled out of the command module via this dump, urine ice crystals would instantly form, which the astronauts came to dub the constellation Orion. <laughs> Now moving, moving a little further to the left, we see this large circular hole, which is a steam vent. Not much to see here, so moving on. Further down the line, over here are yaw engines. Earlier we saw the pitch engines, and these are yaw engines. Both combined to provide maximum stability of the spacecraft during spaceflight. And of course we have another S-band engine. A close flight of stairs allows us to see other key components of the spacecraft from an optimal viewing angle. Let's take a look at those two gray circles surrounded by that black rectangular bezel. The smaller gray circle on the left is a scanning telescope, whereas a larger circle to the right is a space sextant. These were the main navigation instruments the astronauts used in order to navigate their way from the Earth to the Moon and back to Earth again. So obviously, very important instruments to be sure. Well folks, that's all the time we have for right now. Uh, if you're ever in the Dallas area and you're looking for something to do, come here to the Frontiers of Flight Museum. Not only do they have some great planes on display to see, but more importantly, they have the Apollo 7 on display. How few air and space museums are lucky enough to have some important, crucial, valuable space artifact on display like this right here. It's incredible to think that we have one right here in Dallas. Uh, before we conclude the episode, uh, don't uh, forget to uh, tune back in to, for more episodes to come in the near future. And also, lest I forget, special thanks to my dear wife, Rose, for helping out with the filming of some of these key clips. Most appreciated. I love you so much, my dear. So that's it for right now, folks. Until the next time, Keep exploring, keep growing, keep discovering, and keep learning.